Pediatric AKI, Epidemiology and Outcomes. Dr. Siti. Thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank the Saudi Society of Nephrology and Transplantation, uh, especially Dr. Khalid, a friend and a collaborator uh, for inviting me to talk on this topic. So over the next few minutes, I'll be talking about pediatric acute kidney injury, epidemiology and outcomes. And I'll also give a brief overview of how do we manage a child with pediatric acute kidney injury. So this was the first definition, the Akin definition, the acute kidney network, which came in 2007, where they first defined AKI as it should suit all age groups, all the clinical situations, as abrupt within 48 hours reduction in the kidney function as either increase in the serum creatinine or reduction in the urine output. But it's important that we need to diagnose oliguria after excluding easily reversible causes and excluding obstructive causes. Now, this was the first definition in 2007 where they defined creatinine rise of 0.3 milligrams per deciliter as AKI stage one, more than 200 to 300% from the baseline as AKI stage three, stage two here, and more than 300% as AKI stage three. And it's important to remember that if a child was on RRT, that was stage three. Now, that was the first definition, which was planned to be suiting all age groups. And this was the first study published from Texas uh, where they modified the rifle criteria used in adults into pediatrics. So they made a pediatric rifle criteria as they defined the RIFLE as fall in the estimated creatinine clearance or reduction in the urine output. And this study elegantly showed that acute kidney injury occurs early in the PQ. It occurs within the first seven days of pediatric ICU. So remember all of you that acute kidney injury, fluid overload, mortality, all of these outcomes occur early in the pediatric ICU in the first seven days of the ICU stay. So this study showed again that acute kidney injury is an independent predictor for mortality in these children, especially children who are in the ICU. So if we compare the age old pediatric rifle with the current KDGO classification. Now they are almost similar, but here are some differences that KDGO defines is it has a rise of 0.3 milligrams per deciliter or in micromoles per liter or a 50 to 99% rise from the baseline within the seven days of ICU stay. And here are the urine output criteria. Now, if you look at the stage three of KDGO, it says more than 200% increase in the serum creatinine from baseline within the first seven days of your evaluation. Here, we also have need for RRT as stage three. And they also include that, especially in children less than 18 years, a reduction in the EGFR to less than 35 ml per minute as also stage three for KDGO. Now, how do we compare these definitions? And this was an elegant study published in CJSN from Stanford where they looked at almost 14,000 children. So this is the largest study ever, an EMR-based study, where they compared the P-rifle with Ekin with KDGO. And as you can see here, you can see that P-rifle does, it does select more stage one criteria. So it, it is more sensitive. It does diagnose more stage one as compared to the Ekin and the KDGO. So if we compare P-rifle versus all the definitions, whatever definition you use, you use. So especially for the postgraduates, I know there are a lot, lot of postgraduates attending this webinar. Whatever definition you use, all definitions, all stages predict mortality. And as you go up, it predicts more mortality. So they all have a very good interstage discrimination. They all correlate with the length of stay in the ICU. However, the pediatric rifle is more sensitive it will help you diagnose more stage one cases, okay? So pediatric rifle is more sensitive while ekin is more selective. So we do use ekin in more research setting. Now, since we got the KDGO definition now, which is used for pediatrics as well as adults, so we all have started using the KDGO definition because as pediatricians, these children graduate to adults. So we use the same definition as adults. It's less restrictive like ekin, but still now it's a uniform definition for all age groups. Now the 
AKI advisory group from the American Society of Nephrology looked at almost 24 studies looking at almost 1400 children and adults. And they showed that acute kidney injury, the incidence is around 33% in the ICUs. And it's important for all of us to realize and convey it to our colleagues that one in every five adult and one in every three child gets an AKI during the hospital stay. So it's important to look at these children and follow these children. However, there are demographic comparisons. Suppose if we compare AKI in Kenya, the causes are more of infections, sepsis. Two, if you look at United States and more developed world, you'll find post-cardiac surgery, post-bone marrow transplantation, post-transplant as more common causes. And in India, uh, I'll talk more about India here. And we do see hemolytic uremic syndrome, acute glomerulonephritis, nephritis, post-diarrheal acute tubular necrosis as common causes of AKI in our country. So if we look at India over the last few decades, what are the causes and etiologies of pediatric AKI? And the diarrhea, this blue graph shows diarrhea. So the diarrhea-related acute kidney injury seems to reduce. However, hemolytic uremic syndrome appears to be a very common cause of acute kidney injury in our country, followed by infections, infection-associated acute tubular necrosis, glomerulonephritis. So this purple graph shows glomerulonephritis and few causes of obstructive children who already have a CKD obstructive and they get an AKI on the top of that. And I'm happy to share with you that since last two years, we've been trying to collaborate with all the SARC countries in South Asia and looking at what are the causes of AKI, especially severe AKI in children who require dialysis. So almost all the flags which you can see here, almost everyone has collaborated with us and I'll be showing you some data tomorrow when I talk about peritoneal dialysis in children and what are the causes of AKI in children who require dialysis in South Asia. Now, the problem with AKI all over the world is we tend to diagnose it once a patient goes into kidney failure. However, we should be diagnosing it in a child who is at risk and then we need to act early instead of once he's already gone into kidney failure. So who is at risk? Especially children who are on ventilator, who are on inotropes. This is a study from Texas children where they showed that AKI was almost 82% in children who were on inotropes, who were ventilated. This is a study from Montreal where they showed that AKI was seen in almost 18% of all the pediatric ICU stays. This is a study from Los Angeles where they again showed that it was more of around 10% in all the PQ admissions. So sicker the child, higher is the incidence of acute kidney injury. Now, especially for the residents, this is a landmark study, the AWARE study. This was a multinational prospective study done over three months. And the definition which they used for AKI was the KD go definition. And this study showed that the incidence of AKI was 26% in the children, in all the countries where they evaluated them, and the incidence of severe AKI was around 11.6%. And again, this study beautifully showed the interstage discrimination. So higher is the AKI stage. As you can see, there's a much, there's a lot of difference between these two curves, two and three. So if a child gets AKI stage three, he's more likely to die as compared to a child who gets AKI stage two, and AKI stage one. So he's more likely to die. So remember that. This is a study from All India Institute of Medical Sciences where they looked at children who were hospitalized in the wards and ICUs. And they showed that even in non-critically ill children, almost 10% of them had AKI as compared to children who were critically sick. AKI is common post-cardiac surgery and it has been an area of research for all of us. So this is a study from Montreal again, where they showed that AKI was seen in almost 36% of children who underwent a cardiac surgery. And this is a study from Canada, where they showed that if you have a complex surgery in a smaller child, the risk of AKI is very high, almost 64%. So smaller child undergoing a complex cardiac surgery, of course, he's more likely to have an acute kidney injury. 
at Medanta in India, uh, we do a lot of cardiac surgeries in children who get congenital heart disorders. So we just did a retrospective analysis uh, of children. In fact, this was a prospective study where we looked at children over one year who underwent a cardiac bypass and we found that acute kidney injury was seen in almost 20 out of 200, again, around 10%. But it's important to emphasize that children who got AKI stage three post cardiac bypass, in fact, all of them died. So children who required dialysis post bypass, in fact, all of them died. So remember a severe AKI post surgery is a bad marker. And in this study, we also found that children who get AKI are usually young, they are ones who require prolonged inotropes. They have pump failure post bypass. They have septicemia, hematological complications. They require RRT post bypass. So these are bad markers, which may predict that this patient will have a worse outcome. This is a study which talks about that AKI is even common in non-critical ill. All of us, we know if a patient is sick, he is more likely to have acute kidney injury but it's also common in the wards in children who receive aminoglycosides. This is a study from Texas Children's where they looked at children who received aminoglycosides, almost 500 children. And whatever definition you use, whether you use ekin or the pediatric rifle, the risk of AKI varies from 20 to 30% in children who are on aminoglycosides. Now who gets AKI following aminoglycosides? The risk factors are a longer treatment with aminoglycosides if he has received aminoglycosides in the last month. It's common. As the number of nephrotoxins increased, this is a study from Dr. Goldstein from Cincinnati, where they did a retrospective analysis of their patients. And they found that as the number of nephrotoxins increased, there was a stepwise increase in the incidence of acute kidney injury. It's common post vancomycin. Again, a study from Canada, where they showed that children who received vancomycin for more than two days, the incidence of AKI was as high as 14%. Now children, especially who have a higher trough level of vancomycin, or those who also are on concomitant frozomide, they are more likely to have AKI. Now, etiologies vary with age. If we look at newborns, the risk of AKI, there is mostly vascular someone who had cortical necrosis, renal artery thrombosis, renal vein thrombosis, and in utero factors. As they grow older, we see more of hemolytic uremic syndrome, hypoxic ischemic AKI, and post-infectious GN and vasculitis related AKI in older children. Now, if we talk about newborns, the prevalence of AKI varies if this child is a very low birth weight or an extremely low birth weight, the risk of AKI varies from almost 13 to 40% based on the clinical severity. So it's common, especially in children who are septicemic, neonates who are asphyxiated, neonates who are on ECMO. And in all of these studies, which I am showing here, AKI was an independent predictor of mortality. So it's not just the severity of illness, AKI. So patients do die of AKI. It's not just that someone who dies, he has AKI. So in fact, people die of AKI. And all of us as pediatricians are aware that a child who got asphyxia, who got exposure to aminoglycosides and other nephrotoxic agents, whose mother was exposed to NSAIDs, intubation at birth, ventilation, all of these patients are at high risk for AKI. Now, especially for the residents, this was another landmark study, the AWAKEN study. And we were part of it, which we published in Lancet in 2017. So this was a multi-center, multinational observational study in newborns and a very simple inclusion criteria at a newborn who receives IV fluids for at least 24 hours. That's it. A newborn who receives IV fluids for at least 24 hours. And my center was one of the center, the only center in India, which was recruited. So we looked at newborns just for three months and we found that acute kidney injury in newborns was almost 27%. Now, if we divide these newborns into gestation, 36 weaker, 22 to 29 weaker, 29 to 36 weaker, smaller the baby, the more is the prematurity, higher is the risk of acute kidney injury. So babies between 22 to 29 weeks, 
they had almost 43% chance of having AKI as compared to term neonates. And I'm happy to share with you that in 2017, we, we got a, grant, a clinical research grant from the International Society of Nephrology to look at the, to make a neonatal AKI consortium in the country and to look at what are the causes of AKI and how to find the associations between AKI and the clinical outcomes. So we collaborated with a group of cloud nine hospitals and now we have multiple hospitals all over the country. And I'm happy to share with you that we started in 2018 and now we have 2000 newborns collected prospectively. So we now have, and we are about to stop the enrollment now. And if you look at all of these newborns, there is a good proportion of neonates who are preterms, who are early preterms and those who are postterms. So we'll be sharing our data uh, very soon uh, and we'll be looking at what are the factors causing AKI and correlating them with outcomes. Now, we talked about who is at risk, but we also need to look at, we need to risk stratify these patients. Once a patient comes to your triage, you need to know who will require a kidney care later on. And especially for this, a renal angina index was developed by Dr. Chavla and Dr. Goldstein, where they said that you may, even in the triage, you may look at an renal angina index, which was defined as a risk of AKI multiplied by the sign of injury. So suppose you have a PICO admission or a stem cell transplant or a child who is on ventilator and inotropes. So you give him a score. Now you multiply the score with the injury defined as reduction in the estimated creatinine clearance or increase in the fluid overload. So you give multiply, suppose uh, one into five or eight into five. So the score varies between one to 40. Now there've been multiple studies on performance of this index to predict a severe AKI after three days. So this is uh, an analysis published in KI where they showed that all of us use illness scores like PRISM scores and PIM scores in the ICU. But if you look at a renal angina index, defined by reduction in the estimated creatinine clearance or increase in the fluid overload or any worse of them. In fact, they perform better than the usual illness score. So if you look at the area under the curve here, the area under the curve of renal angina index is much higher than the usual illness scores, which we all use in the ICUs. And they outperform even the KD go definition. So if you look at the KD go definition, its ability to look for the AKI prediction. So renal angina index plus defined as a score more than eight has a very good sensitivity and a very good negative predictive value. So suppose a patient who is in the triage whose renal angina index is less than eight, he's less likely to have a severe AKI later on. Now, if you incorporate a biomarker in the triage, so this is a data published in NDT where they looked at if you add just an N gal in the triage, the area under the curve to predict a acute kidney injury later on increases significantly from 0.8 to 0.97. So all of you, maybe this is the dream curve. Once you have a patient who is admitted in your PICU, you do a renal angina assessment after the initial resuscitation. Now, if his RAI score is high, maybe you can take a cutoff of eight, then this is a child who needs specialized renal care. You limit the nephrotoxins, avoid the contrast, do the hemodynamic support. And this is the patient in whom you can do a biomarker assessment. I know everyone does not have access to NGAL or other cytokines. So maybe you can select the patient in whom you can assess and look at the biomarkers. And you may need to avoid the fluid overload. Think of early RRT initiation in these patients. Now, how do you, what happens to these patients later on? Now, this is a very important study. Now, talking about follow-up of these patients. Now, on follow-up of these patients, this is a study from Cherry Memon, one of my friend from British Columbia. He looked at children who got AKI in the PICU and he looked at 
what happened to them later on so almost half of them had aki following cardiac surgery now he defined ckd as a child whose gfr is less than 60 or or an albuminuria they this was a beautiful study because they also looked at children who are at risk of ckd as mildly reduced gfr or even hyperfiltration and he showed that children who got aki a sizable proportion proportion of them ha- had proteinuria risk of ckd later on hypertension and even hyperfiltration in a very good proportion of them so there is a need to follow up these children as well and there are a lot of studies on follow up of these patients but i would like to emphasize cherry memon study is the only prospective study ret- rest are retrospective analysis looking at the outcome of these patients i know this is a busy slide but this shows that we need to follow these patients for gfr later on risk of esrd later on risk of proteinuria hypertension because they need to be followed up for all of these complications so remember that we need to follow children who get aki for these complications highlighted here on the screen now what happens to them on long term now this is a study from dr prasad devarajan where he showed that even 7 years after a bypass children even had a high biomarker so there was no protein urea creatinine had normalized no hypertension but their kim1 to creatinine ratio was much higher as compared to children who were not having aki so we don't know what it means but there was ongoing inflammation in these children even years after a, a cardiac bypass associated aki so we did a rox trial looking at long term outcome of aki in children post bypass and we uh, this was a result of a isn grant and we showed and we sh- in fact we presented that at the wcn last year that children if we look at what predicts the gfr at follow up so especially children who have a prolonged bypass this was statistically significant so especially a child who has a prolonged bypass or a child who had a previous aki these children may have a low egfr on follow up so we do need to follow these children on follow up so to summarize and uh, i'll again show the same conceptual model that whenever we manage a child with aki it's important to identify do the risk stratification in these children we may need to do biomarkers in a select group of children it's important that in these children we prevent the nephrotoxins avoid fluid overload nutrition is a very important aspect and we need to take care of their nutrition especially if a child is on dialysis we need to do optimize his nutrition drug dosing is very important because as nephrologists we are aware about that but we need to sensitize our colleagues that they do need renal dose modification as those as per their renal function and we need to optimize rrt based on the child if he is very sick we may need to start rrt early and last but not the least we do need to follow up these children on a regular basis to look for the complications that was that was my last slide and i thank uh, ssn again Uh, for inviting me to talk on this topic thank you uh thank you for dr city for this uh, elegant lecture i really enjoyed it uh so until i read the questions i have a question of my own i was very interested in the study you wrote about acute kidney injury and vancomycin uh you showed that the risk of aki was very 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 high in those who had concomitant fosamide uh, use and as you know a lot of intensive it will, will give fosamide when there is oliguria so would you advise against this practice what do you think about so uh, as intensivists uh, uh, since i am a nephrologist and we need to you know uh, be uh, friends with the neonatologists i know most of these neonates are on fosamide but it's good to sensitize them of associations of children who are on concomitant fosamide with vancomycin and uh, i'm happy to share with you that uh, especially in india we have very good relations with the neonatologists in the country and we have been able to sensitize them about uh, the existence of neonatal aki 
and i'm sure uh, we will be publishing a lot on this in the near future so it's important to sensitize them excellent uh, any questions in the q and e uh, let me check Uh, what about uh, the angina index? Uh, do you think it, it reached its final uh, mood or there is, they can't tweak it more to be more accurate? You're right. Uh, since uh, we, we believe that this is not for neonates, and in fact, uh, I know uh, my friend Rupesh, uh, it's his next talk. So we have collaborated with neontologists and in fact, very soon we are coming with an index, especially for neonates. Like, so this is not exactly uh, tuned for every child. So uh, for a neonates, maybe we need to have another index and another name for that. So we need to have another index for, especially for neonates. Thank you very much. And we're looking for, forward for your work. Thank, thank you. you. I, I think that's the end of it. And thank you for uh, giving it at uh, appropriate time. Thank you, Dr. Sethi. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Adi, and thank you, Dr. Kumar, for this uh, um, excellent lecture. Uh, I think we move to the second uh, uh, talk. Uh, Dr. Bukhari Manizi, you can go ahead and introduce Dr. Robesh. Yeah, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. It's really my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Robesh uh, Reina. And for those who really joined later, uh, Dr. Robesh Reina is uh, an adult pediatric kidney disease, hypertension nephrologist at Akron Children's Hospital, and also Akron General Medical Center in Cleveland Clinic. So he's taking care of both really pediatric and adult, which is really something uh, unique. Uh, he's also uh, working as associate professor at a new uh, med medical university and Case Western Reserve University. He's uh, active also in uh, research and he's really in the area of interest in the research in the bone marrow transplant and heritage metabolic disease, uh, also in the transition of adolescent with chronic renal disease to adulthood care and other area of uh, interest. So join me to uh, welcome Dr. Robish uh, Rena again, and uh, he will talk about the renal replacement therapy uh, in patients with involved error of metabolism. Dr. Robish, please. Thank you, thanks a lot. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to present and a special thanks to Dr. Khalid Hassan for getting me an opportunity to attend the conference. And uh, so I'm gonna talk about the role of kidney replacement therapy in, in bone of metabolism. What is, what is a nice transition? I just did a talk on the um, advances in AKI and uh, this was the part that I was very much inclined to include, but I said, I'll do it in the second talk. So let's start this case because in bone error of metabolism as a nephrologist is a very tough case when you deal with. And just to perspective, we'll start with the case. We have a patient was the smaller pair of the twin delivered by 24 year old primary gavita at an outside institution because of this twins intrauterine growth retardation labor was introduced at 36 weeks. At birth, he weighed around three pounds and nine ounces. And over the first nine days of life, he required intravenous glucose in addition to his isomel feeds to maintain euglycemia. Then he was switched to the breast milk on day nine and subsequently developed feeding intolerance and emesis. On day 10, he became lethargic and developed a strong body odor. Lab study revealed mild serum ammonia of 206 with no acidosis. The next day he became progressively more lethargic and subsequently comatose. His serum ammonia was 1,396 millimole per liter and there was no acidosis at this time he was transferred to our hospital. The patient clinical sign symptoms were suggestive of the inborn error of metabolism. There was an increased level of ammonia. And, but the concern was that since ammonia is very high, but there's no acidosis, this was suggestive of a urea cycle disorder, which prompt us to do a serum amino acid analysis by high performance liquid chromatography and urine organic acid analysis by chromatography and mass spectrography. So, Let's start with this case where you have these kind of presentations, like if you get a case of a inborn error of metabolism, what are your differentials? Is it a urea cycle disorder? Is it organic acidemia? 
is the transient hyperammonia of the newborn, which is a condition we see in some of the healthy newborn severe asphyxia that could also cause increased uh, protein breakdown during hypoxic stress plus liver damage due to ischemia, or you have a liver failure due to multiple causes, particularly an in infection. Now, this was a guidelines which was published in Nature uh, Nephrology. And uh, I hope if Dr. Khalid Hassan is here or not, he was one of our consensus panelists. And this guideline was done in an effort because whenever I look for the inborn and of metabolism, there was nothing. It was very few literature, especially in the setting of the pediatric population. And the authors were all uh, one of my colleagues who is in case, uh, Dr. Girari K. Bidian. He has done a lot of work on the urea cycle disorder, uh, uh, disorder and Uta Lecher Konenki, who is uh, the OTC um, uh, person. So we have a lot of uh, genetists and uh, the uh, nephrologists involved in the guidelines. Now, when you look onto these kind of hyperammonia, the overall this, we call this as a small molecule disease. The incidence overall is around one in 91. 9,160. Organic aciduria is around 1 in 21,000. Urea cycle is 1 in 41,000. Fatty acid oxidation defects are around 1 in 91,000. Now, the thing is, age of onset, if you look, this is a paper published in 2002. The neonates, you get around 40%, infant 30, child around 20, adult around 5 to 10%. There's a beautiful uh, paper, uh, the diagrams, which shows how does the urea is converted into various uh, metabolites. And there are six channels that could be inhibited or six enzymes that will be involved in the urea cycle disorders. One of them is the uh, CM, uh, CPS or OTC, ASS, ASL, or arginine deficiency or NAGAS deficiency. You can see like a simple example of the CP deficiency, you have increased in the orate uh, metabolite. Now, when you get these patients, and it's, it's kind of a tough to do that because you don't know what to target and what are you dealing with these patients, uh, how to navigate these kind of six cycle disorders or six enzyme deficiency. The way I have followed and we have used the same algorithm in our uh, consensus guideline you measure the plasma ammonia concentration. And if it is more than 150 mole per liter, you obtain the anion gap plasma glucose concentration. If you have other metabolic disorders like uric organic acid, plasma amino acid, or acyl carnitine, you will have anion gap more than 20 or you will have hypoglycemia. If you have a urea cycle disorder, the anion gap is less than 20 and plasma glucose concentrations are normal. So this is a right way of just segregating here between the urea cycle versus another urine organic acid or plasma amino acid disorder. Then you have the patients with low urine anion gap and you have the spectrum of uh, plasma glucose concentration normal. Then you obtain the amino acid. If you have low citrulline and arginine, then you obtain the urine aurotic acid. And if it is elevated, you have OTC. If it is um, low or normal, then you have N-gas deficiency. You obtain citrulline plasma concentration. If it is elevated, it is arginosuccinate. And you obtain the red cell or fibrolyzed enzyme assay for that. If it is low, then you have uh, the deficiency of uh, arginosuccinate absent. Then you look for Markedly elevated plasma arginine concentration confirmed this is an arginine deficiency and you have to do a red enzyme assay. So this is just algorithm for you to keep in hand when you deal these patients to nail down, going back to our original slide, what are, what are the six enzymes that you're dealing with the urea cycle disorder. The best thing I like is the approach to the IEM. I always keep it in my hand. If you have ABG and you have metabolic acidosis, elevated ammonia, then you have uh, all the organic acidemia and you will have ketonuria plus uric organic acid and increase in ion gap. You will have methyl malonic acid, propanoic, isovaleric. If it's normal serum anomia, uh, ammonia, but you have metabolic acidosis, then um, median change or MS, MSET is there. If you have ABG normal, which was a case in this case, there was no acidosis you, and ammonia is high, then you have a urea cycle disorder and they're present with respiratory alkalosis and lactic acidosis. But if you have normal ABG, normal uh, 
uh, ammonia level, then it is galactosemia, which is non-ketotic hyperglycemia. So I really like this kind of approach when I go into the, and, and look into these uh, patients, it's easy for me. And you can see in this case, the patient that came to us, he doesn't have any respiratory acidosis, uh, sorry, metabolic acidosis, and his anion gap was normal and his glucose was normal. So just to kind of have this in your, in your armamentarium, it's easy to deal with the patients with uh, uh, inborn error of metabolism. Now, if you look into the characteristic, these are small non-protein molecule, relatively small distribution, best clears by diffusion, high to a very high generation rate. They're, that's why you need a high clearance of these generation of this uh, orotic acid or any byproduct. Many patients are neonates, so it's very, very hard because of the shift of the amino acids. All these um, metabolites, you can have a change in the in the uh, brain swelling, you will have a change in the shift of uh, the electrolytes and solutes. Well, ammonia in an average always lies on the form of ammonium. So it's ammonium hydroxide. And if you have a pH of around 7.35 um, to 7.42, you have 98% 90, of them, they are present as an ammonia. I am the biggest thing you have to realize, usually an acute patient solute is distributed in a known volume, more or less bound to protein in a stable physiochemical condition. So it's a first order kinetics. Usually in a patient with a chronic patients, chronic uh, disorders like oxalosis, solute undergo a various physiochemical changes causing it reversible accumulations. It's a complex kinetics. So dealing with the inborn error of metabolism, it's a first order kinetic, you know the distribution of molecule, it's a small molecule, water soluble, so easy to remove. Infant with hyperammonia presence with lethargy, hypotonia, tachypnea, when they have an ammonia level of 150, and you've seen in this case, the ammonia level went up to 1000. This was a real case. and. Worse outcome is associated with persisted ammonia level more than 800 for 24 hours of prolonged coma. These are the things that you have to keep in mind. Prompt treatment is necessary. Hyperammonia is extremely toxic to brain per se or through intracellular ex excessive glutamine formation because that's what happened when you have uh, the uh, urea, it converts to glutamate causing astrocyte swelling, brain edema, coma, death or severe disability. Thus, emergency treatment has to be started even before having a precise diagnosis since prognosis mainly depends on the coma duration. This is again our paper, which we have shown the neonate, as you can see, and the infant and children's the spectrum is totally different. Actually, it is so, I have one patient who has the uh, UCD, um, OTC disorder, and he presented just with a psychiatric manifestation, behavioral disorder, mood changes, hyperactivity, aggressiveness, and he has some confusion, migraine-like headaches. So very different presentation in the adult spectrum or in the children's as compared to neonate. They will just come with a poor feeling and vomiting, lethargy, and somnolent, which was the case in our case that I presented to you. If they have hepatomegaly, they will have decreased urea production, increased hepatic enzymes. They get respiratory distress, tachypnea, hyperventilation, and respiratory alkalosis, and hypothermia. Life-threatening concerns are basically acute encephalopathy, cerebral edema, and they progress very fast. Now, what are the progress, prognostic indicators? Non-informative and informative. Non-informative ammonia peak mean of ventilatory support, dialysis mode type of the disease, whether it's a urea cycle disorders or it is um, any other spectrum of those six enzymes that I said, except for the OTC deficiency, post-treatment start coma duration. Informating, informatic prognostic indicators are total coma duration, pre-treatment start coma duration, and whether they are responsive to the pharmacological therapy. What do we do next now? You have this patient prevent the further catabolizing by providing adequate calories, fluids, and electrolyte. Minimize their protein intake. Provide alternate pathway for ammonia removal. May require CRRT, hemodialysis, or parentonian dialysis for ammonia removal. So we have this patient now. What are we going to do? We have to give a supportive uh, management, discontinuing all feet, provide adequate calories by IV glucose and lipid, maintain glucose infusion rate, which has been mentioned here. We have also published in our guideline. But there is another mode that I want you to look at that you can direct the catabolism and prevent the formation of the toxic elements through the excessive urea, like sodium benzoate and 
sodium phenylbutrate, L-arginine, and L-carnitine. So what do we do when you have, and this is a phenylbutrate, it, when you give phenylacetate, it combines, phenylbutrate converts to phenylacetate that con con uh, combine with glutamate and find phenyl phenylacetylglutamate. This can remove, phenylbutrate can remove two molecules of ammonia and thus decreases the endogenous level of ammonia. Now, ammonia can be converted into glycine. So what happened when you give benzoate, which converts into benzoyl coenzyme, it combined with glycine to form hupric acid or hupric. And that will take one molecule of ammonia with that intake. So thus, this is what we call as supportive measurement where you have alternative pathways for ammonia secretion. And again, what you can do is with arginine, with CPS deficiency and urea cycle, you can actually load them with 300 milligram per kilogram per day, um, which is not available in certain part of the developing country. And you can, you can just try to navigate till you prepare what next is gonna happen to decrease the metabolites. Those are toxic to the brain, those are toxic to the body and can help that process going. What next? We have done that. Then you come to the kidney replacement therapy. And what, what are you gonna do? What would you have? There is no data to show which therapy is better. There is data in inborn error of metabolism that you have to act prompt because you have to start any kind of renal modality when your ammonia concentration is more than 400. And in this kid, it was 1300, which is beyond my level. Now let's go each and every uh, modality why we think CRRT is good because it has diffusive and convective mechanism and it's provide more hemodynamically stability and volume control. While you have to also keep in mind most of these patients with hyperammonia, they are not ischemic and they're not volume overloaded. So we produce or we speculate that CRRT would be a preferred treatment modality due to high risk of hemodynamic instability from the underlying metabolic disorder, small patient size, use of the drug that increased nitroxic release, arginine, and lower systemic pressure. But again, this is not, we didn't grade it very high. This is what our suggestion, but any modality, any modality that can remove the small molecule of ammonia, it's, a, it's less protein bound, it's first order kinetic, you need to instituted now because we did all these symptomatic management and we are stuck with ammonia level of more than 400. If you do PD, you're doing diffusion and ultrafiltration. Efficacy, very poor. Tolerance, poor. Hemodialysis, diffusion, perfect. It's a, it's a water-soluble molecule. It's a small molecule. Very high efficiency and tolerance, poor because of the hemodynamic perturbation. Continuous hemofiltration, modality, ultrafiltration. Efficiency of a small molecule, poor to good, but tolerance, very good. If you do continue hemodiafiltration, that is diffusion and ultrafiltration, the efficacy of these small molecules are very high and the tolerance is very good. This is a very nice uh, depiction in our paper that we published. It shows how much at what level of your blood flow and what level of your dialysate, how much will be the ammonia clearance per ml per minute per kilogram of the body. So you can calculate if you do the blood flow of 20 ml per minute and the dialysate of 0.5 liter per hour, you can say that at certain hour, I will see this much clearance and the, filter, the ammonia filtration fraction will be gone down to like 12%. So this is good for you to pick up the modality. You can see that the ammonia clearance was very high for the hemodialysis because it is a diffusive clearance and ammonia filtration fraction is very good. But because of the hemodynamic instability, these patients are sick. We prefer to do CBVH. CBVHD is better because you are involving both diffusion and convective and has a good amount of clearance of ammonia. Prepare hemodiafiltration if significant encephalopathy and early, early high blood ammonia levels are there. Take into account the sodium intake if sodium benzoate or sodium uh, PBA was used. And if no rapid drop within three to six, you should start working on it. Let's go to the consensus panel and let's see if you have PD. What, does we, what do we suggest? We said that, that PD, when other modality replacement are not available, then you use PD. And the indications for using PD is rapidly deteriorating neurological status, coma or cerebral edema or ammonia level of more than 400. 
Or the other thing is rapid increase or rise in ammonia more than 300 millimol, micromole per liter within a few hours that cannot be controlled via non-RRT medical measures. But again, we graded that 3B, but if you are in a country where you do not have resources, PD is still a poor clearance, but you have to understand it's a low molecular molecular weight, water soluble ammonium. So still you can help in removal of the urea. Now consensus panel for hemodialysis. Now we still say that for hyperammonia, the panel recommend initiating intermittent uh, hemodialysis when you see neurological status deteriorating, coma or cerebral edema. Hemodialysis or high dose CRRT may be used for initial therapy for patients with ammonia level more than 1,000. And this is a case in our, our patient was 1,360. So we prefer for you to have um, high dose CRRT or hemo because you want a rapid clearance, at least bring it down to the level of 400 or so, so you do not have a lot of shift with the brain electrolytes or you get an edema. Hemodialysis preparation, you have to be careful. Now, we are doing this hemo on this patient, your blood flow rate should be 30 to, uh, 3 to 5 ml per minute. You should have dialysis flow more than 300 ml per minute. You should have duration four hours or until the level of ammonia is less than 200, whichever comes first. Goal for KT over ammonia is around two at two hours and then you switch the patient to CRRT. Hemo machines should be cooled down there to 34 patient to randomize to the cooling. Filter surface area, you need to approximate with the body surface area. Replace phosphorus, replace uh, magnesium, replace uh, any kind of potassium because these patients do not have renal failure. So because of the diffusive clearance, they lose electrolytes. So make sure you deplete phosphorus, check every four hours. Measure ammonia level at 30 minutes and then at least every two hours. Now, treatment duration may be unknown at onset and will be determined by the nephrologist, but treatment often exceeds typical three to four hours of the time. Now, one thing is very important. While discontinuing the treatment, clamp the lines if the circuit was primed with blood. Do not return the blood in the system to the patient. Discard the entire setup with the blood in it to avoid increasing the child's blood volume. After hemodialysis treatment is, con is completed, serum ammonia level 100 times 2, follow ammonia level closely observing the rebound effect. Now, this is very important because you see the rebound effect and this ammonia level start coming up. Now, how would you calculate the fractional excretion or the clearance? And that is something you have to do systemic to the excess ammonia, systemic to the return ammonia, and you can calculate the reduction ratio of ammonia. And this is the, how you calculate blood flow into access line ammonia return versus access line. And you should have the clearance of ammonia should be equal to the blood flow. Now, this is very, very important. If RR is more than 10% and CNIH4, consider repositioning or replacing the dialysis access because you are having some kind of a recirculation goal because it should be less than 10. So this is kind of a good calculation. I have one patient where I have an issue with the recirculation, and this is good calculation to keep that in mind. This is what's happening with the patients who have, you do the hemodialysis, you remove it in three to four hours, and then they start accumulating. You will see the rebound effect. And that's what we suggested in our guideline. You should transition them to CVVHD. So this patient, we did hemo, we brought it down to 600, and then we put him on the CVVHDF so that there is a continuous decrease in the ammonia level, so you do not see the ammonia rebound uh, and the, the cascade can come back once the ammonia level is high. What does the panel recommend for CRRT? That is our mode of uh, therapy. If you have a level more than 150 or you have neurological status of coma or cerebral edema, presence of shock, or if you have a persistently high level of uh, uh, blood level more than 400, refracted to any kind of non-RRT, similar to that of the hemo. Now, recommendation from our panel is that rapid rise in ammonia more than 300 within a few hours that cannot be controlled by any other RRT medical therapies. And again, if you have done the hemo and you brought the level from 1,000 to 600 within two hours or within an hour, you see it's accumulating around 800, 900. It's better to have a hybrid therapy. A warming system may be used to warm the dialysis to help maintain hemodynamic stability in patients who receive CRRT. You need to have QB to QD ratio should be more than 1.5. And uh, you should use this as a primary modality when the patients 
ammonia level is more than 1,000. And step down CRRT can follow. So what we are doing is now we do the high flow CRRT, which is in the adult is 50 ml per kilogram per hours, and you start checking the levels. And you can switch it to the step down CRRT, which is 30 ml per kilogram per hour. In, in the children's, I'll give another slide to show you the high flow CRRT. And you do it initially when the level is more than 1,000 to bring the level down to a certain level so you'll have less catastrophic effect. This is a nice slide which shows how the clearance will be with various kind of um, extracorporeal peritoneal dialysis. Now here you see the PD with CVVHD, CAVHD, and hemodialysis. Hemodialysis level comes down very, very quickly, but definitely CVVHD is better. Just after hemo is CVVHD or CVVH, CAVHD, and you can see the level goes very slow with the peritoneal dialysis. Now, what is this high dose CRRT? It's a clearance with 8,000 8, ml per 1.73 meters square per hour. And high dose CRRT can be transitioned <clears throat> to regular CRRT once serum level is less than 200 for at least two measurement and net ultrafilter rate should be matched or below the patient's intake since these patients are often polyuric and dehydrated. So do not take out a lot of fluid, rather I sometimes run them positive. Add maximum amount of phosphorus to the replacement solute or dialysis as these patients do not have hyperphosphatemia. And if you have a heparin-based anticoagulation, you support it with phosphorus IV internally. Now measure the ammonia level at 30 minutes and then at least every two hours. And again, you measure RFV, magnesium, ABG, CBC at least every four hours. Follow routine labs for anticoagulation. Then after that, you do the step down CRRT. And this could be initiated after hemodialysis or high dose CRRT to prevent the amount of ammonia above 200. Clearance, replacement or dialysate flow rate will be at least, will be total at least at 2,500 ml per 1.732 meters square per hour. CRRT will be discontinued at least until serum ammonia is less than 100 during the last four hours on at least two measurement and net ultrafiltration rates will be matched to or below the patient's intake since these patients are often polyuric and dehydrated. Now, this is another thing that we have put in our recommendation. The consensus panel suggested the use of CRRT combined with ECMO in small neonates, especially those who are hemodynamically unstable. And uh, the consensus panel suggested that use of CRRT combined with ECMO for the treatment of hyperammonia in the following situation, that you have a hemodynamic instability in a small neonate with a very poor access for the CRRT, rapidly deteriorating neurological status, coma, cerebral edema, presence of shock, persistently high blood ammonia level more than 400 refracted to non-RRT medical measurement, a rapidly rise in ammonia level more than 300 within few hours that happen in this patient that cannot be controlled via any other non-RRT therapy. I think when I was doing the advances in the, advances in the sepsis AKI, this is our paper we published for COVID-19 and we have shown you the connection. I do not put the plain filter. I recommend you to do the CRRT with the ECMO with, we generally do VV ECMO, and you can see the patient's venous access. This is a CRRT machine. This is your replacement fluid. This is your dialysate, and this is your effluent, and the patient will get the um, effluent out. So you do the CVVHDF uh, modality here, and then it goes to the, uh, to the ECMO membrane oxygenator and patient's RT will return. So this is a good paper to show you the connection between the CRRT and the VV with ECMO. And that is what recommendations from the, from the panel for the hybrid therapy. Now, this is a nice uh, systemic review we did in RRT neonatal hyperammonia, data for literature, as you can see, peritoneal dialysis, hemo, continuous hemofiltration, continuous hemodialysis. Um, uh, the ammonia clearance, you can see around 0.71 poorest in the PD. Hemo was the best because of the diffusive clearance. And you can see continuous hemodialysis, which is CVVHDF 4.4, survival rate 56, 70%, 67, 81%. Patient's neurological outcome was better with the hemo because you have brought up the level more quickly. And also with CVVHDF, the episode was very lower in the setting of CVVHD because of the, um, uh, the best effect of the hemodynamic stability. You have to be careful with the metabolic cocktail drug clearance. 
because people are giving phenyl acetate, phen benzenate, arginate, they'll all be cleared very, very quickly from the CBBHDF because they are small molecular weight, minimal protein binding, volume of distribution is low. So you need to rebolus the phenyl acetate, benzoate, and arginine because this is a paper by Maxwell et al. You can see the total amino acid loss in the CBBH and CBBHDF. So whenever I see these patients, I always give a loading dose of these metabolites directing pathways, because if you give them phenyl acetate or benzoate, they get removed very quickly in the setting of convective and diffusing. So let's talk about the uh, take home messages. Kidney replacement therapy induced rapid clearance of ammonia. Four hours seems a reasonable time for the pharmacological treatment before the KRT initiation. Hemodialysis and CBVHDF with a high dialysate flow seems the best option. However, PD induced similar plasma ammonium decay in the face of lower ammonia clearance. Negative nitrogen balance decreased ammonia generation and better ex expertise with PDs in the neonate, but still the clearance is low. Severe hyperammonia can be reversed also by pharmacological treatment. Response to dialysis can be useless if coma duration before treatment is too long because then you have a permanent brain damage. So the conclusion, one third of the patient respond to the pharmacological therapy alone, but when you have a level of 1300, then you're not reading for that. It's just, a sub, uh, it's just a substitute, but you still have to give the CRRT. Median term outcome did not depend on the dialysis modality. A pre-treatment coma duration exceeding 24 to 30 hours is almost invariably associated with poor outcome in both medically treated and dialyzed patient, irrespective of the treatment rapidly. So conclusion two, in neonate hyperammonia, CBVH provide better treatment continuity, efficacy, and cardiovascular ability and stability. Major effort should be made for rapid identification of patient, early start of appropriate treatment, and quick refers to the center. Some outcome quality of life is still is out there. We don't know what it is. But I think what I will suggest, if you have a patient which is more than um, 40, 400 and above, I will, I will highly suggest you to do the hybrid therapy. Do the hemo and then switch the patient to the CRRT so the endogenous prevention could be prevented from the continuous removal of the CBVHD and then you can the blood levels. If it is less than 100 for two consecutive for four hours, then you can start stop the therapy and see how the things are. Be very careful with the cerebral edema because the poor outcome is mainly the neurological one. And again, it's all important to have this mind how to diagnose. If you have a patient with elevated ammonia, metabolic acidosis, what are your diagnosis? If you have a patient with metabolic acidosis, normal serum ammonia, it's MSUD. If you have abnormal, abnormal ABG, no acidosis, high when you're dealing with urea cycle disorder, the respiratory Dr. Robesh? And if you have uh, abnormal ABG, normal ABG, then you're dealing with gas. With that, I want to thank you. And it Dr. is Robert, yes. Can we, because we have time almost uh, finished, so if we can just finish and to allow for the questions. Yes, go ahead. I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'd like to thank you, uh, Dr. Reina. And we have uh, some questions. We can just have maybe one of them or two maximum. So if this does continuous flow peritoneal dialysis provide acceptable clearance of ammonia? in a way better than regular BD in area where HD or CFHD not available? It's, as I said, when I was telling you about the uh, different modality, I will recommend just go for CCPD. Okay, I think there's it's another starts. question when it comes to uh, sometimes in certain cases where we have an uh, in, in born in metabolism with normal ammonia, uh, yeah, but with high branched chain amino acid level. So how to use uh, the RRT? So that one, that's a very good question. And, uh, you know, we have written, I will highly recommend you to read our guidelines. Those are hard to remove because of the high uh, long fat, like long chain amino acids. I will, at that point of time, will recommend to do convective and diffusive therapy using CVBHDF. You can do a step down approach with CVBHDF using a high dose for eight hours and then switch it to the lower dose after eight hours. Okay, by this, I think we'd like to conclude by thanking you, Dr. Rena, for this comprehensive, excellent presentation and to also thank the audience. Thank you. Thanks.
Okay, so uh, thank you, Dr. Abdul Karim and Dr. Robish Rena. Uh, now we move to the next uh, presentation, and um, can Dr. Uh, Khalid Al Sheikh can uh, kindly introduce Dr. Naif Abdul Majid. Please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good evening, everyone. I would like to thank the organizing uh, committee for uh, such a big conference to have it virtually. And uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Naif Abdul Majid. He's a colleague of mine, and he's very well known uh, nationally. He's a consultant pediatric nephrologist in Berlin Sultan Medical City. He got Saudi Board of Pediatric Nephrology, uh, Saudi Board of Pediatric, as well as Arab Board of Pediatric. Then after that, he got uh, Saudi Fellowship of Pediatric Nephrology. Uh, then he joined uh, McMaster University, where he got his also pediatric nephrology. He's also a member of uh, uh, pediatric uh, nephrology fellowship exam committee, and his uh, big interest in uh, transplant as well as uh, dialysis. Uh, uh, he's going to talk in the next 30 minutes in sleep disorder in children regular hemodialysis. So uh, welcome, Dr. Naif, and the mic is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Khalid, for introducing me. Uh, I'm glad to participate in, um, in this symposium. I want to thank the Saudi Society of Nephrology and Kidney Transplantation for inviting me. <clears throat> so my talk today, will, uh, I will talk about sleep disorder in children, particularly with the renal failure and hemodialysis. So my objective will be introduction, then I will talk about the pathophysiology, uh, sleep apnea definition and classification, and eventually I will talk about the epidemiology. So sleep disorder in healthy children have been associated with the negative neurocognitive ability as well behavioral deficit, which include an attention, poor school performance, reduced health related quality of life. The prevalence of sleep disorder during the childhood has been estimated in healthy child between 25 to 35%. In adult dialysis patient, sleep disorder is independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease, which increase the morbidity and the mortality. 80% of the endothelial disease patients which are receiving dialysis, they report sleep complaint with the daytime sleepness to be the most common reported symptom. Sleep complaint have received an increased attention in the last 10 years. So now we'll talk about the pathophysiology. In healthy individual, sleep is accompanied by a decrease in the sympathetic activity and increase in the vagal tone that lead to nocturnal dipping of blood pressure. The chronic kidney disease having the opposite, they often exhibit hyperactivity of the sympathetic nervous system with a decrease in vagal tone and that imbalance due to paroreceptor reflux function impairment. Melatonin is another factor is a hormone secreted by the pineal gland and it is responsible for the sleep, mainly the wake circadian rhythm. It's secreted in a small amount during the daytime but increased during the night, which correlate with the onset of nocturnal sleepness. <clears throat> this is a small cross-sectional study which compared 30 patients with endothelial disease on hemodialysis versus 20 healthy participants, they found that nocturnal melatonin level were significantly lower in patients with endothelial disease. 22 patients from 30 patients also liked the circadian rhythm in melatonin secretion. Hemodialysis kidney transplantation was not showing any improvement in melatonin concentration. And there is a limited study that supports starting renal failure patient in melatonin and was not studied in pediatric yet. So how to assess sleep in um, patient? First, by the history and accurate history of concurrent medical and psychiatric disorder. And then the retrospective, which is the questionnaire this is the most common questionnaire, Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, uh, reported by PICE in 1989, 
and a fourth sleepness scale, which reported in June in 1991. And this questionnaire is the most common used in the recent study. Insomnia Severity Index by Pastin in 2001 and Berlin Sleep Apnea Questionnaire by Nitzer in 1999. What also we have the prospective, which is self-report sleep wake dairy or sleep logos. We have another measurement, which call it behavioral measurement, actigraphy, and we have the gold standard, which polysomnography. They having multiple monitor, which include EEG, EMG, pulse oximetry, and etc. So now I will talk about the most common questionnaire have been used in the recent study and also in the pediatric study, what we called Epworth Sleepness Scale. It was developed in 1990 as a measure of daytime sleepness for adults. It's a simple self-report questionnaire with eight question and response in the four point Likert scale from zero to three. Official modified version was proposed by John and validated in 2017 by Kitty. So this simple questionnaire with picture asking about falling of a sleep chance in different activity, activity like sitting, reading, watching TV, and it has been modified to be children suitable. All somnography, uh, the gold standard, is objectively monitor sleep pattern, obstructive sleep apnea, and fragmented sleep. But this, the gold standard, cannot assist the daytime sleepness, as daytime sleepness most times assist by questionnaire. Now I will talk about sleep apnea. A sleep apnea is a chronic sleep disorder which causes repeated cessation of breath while a person is sleeping. It's characterized of sleep apnea, which include loud snoring, breathlessness, waking up from sleep, and daytime sleepness. The prevalence in general population is approximately two to four percent and reach among the adult patient from 50 to 60 percent. And some of the study based on the pulsomnography, it reached to 70 to 80 percent of patient with end stage renal disease. There is no clear relation between the sleep apnea and end stage renal disease. However, several studies have examined what we call it rostral fluid shift as a possible mechanism in the pathogenesis of obstructive sleep apnea in chronic kidney disease patients. Due to their reclined position overnight, excess fluid shift from the leg toward the neck, leading to upper airway restriction and collapse. One study tested this theory by measuring the neck circumference and leg fluid volume in end stage renal disease patient with obstructive sleep apnea. And the change in the leg fluid volume correlate with a significant change in the neck circumference, supporting the idea that leg fluid is displaced into the neck overnight. And because of that, researcher has shown that conversion from conventional hemodialysis to nocturnal hemodialysis may reduce the occurrence of apnea. <clears throat> Insomnia uh, is an ability to fall asleep or stay asleep to diagnose need three nights per week for at least three months. The prevalence in general population vary from four to 29% and in end-stage renal disease from 50 to 75% in adults. The research are suggesting factors like chronic pain, stress, older age, dialysis shift, melatonin hormone, and high parathyroid hormone that all play a role in the developmental of insomnia and end stage renal disease. There is a recent published systemic review by Dr. Tan, which was showing significant high prevalence of insomnia among adult patients with end stage renal disease, and that more significantly on those on peritoneal dialysis. Restless leg syndrome is a sensory motor disorder manifested by unpleasant nocturial sensation 
in the lower limb that are relieved by movement. Untreated of the restless leg syndrome is highly associated with the depression. There is no monogenic cause has been yet found. The proposed risk factor which include anemia, iron deficiency, but in the recent study was showing there is no relation between the wrist leg syndrome and the iron deficiency. Another factor is alteration dopaminergic and aboid and also peripheral neuropathy, which is associated with the uremia. In general population, it's vary from three to seven percent. In hemodialysis patient from 20 to 30 percent and in transplant patient around 5%. Now I'll talk about the excessive daytime somnolence or sleepness. Is inability to stay awake or alert through the course of the day. The prevalence from general population from 10 to 12 percent, 66 percent in chronic kidney disease, especially those in hemodialysis. These all are based in the adult uh, study. There is multiple factors which include uremia, high prevalence of periodic limb movement, and high prevalence of sleep apnea. What about children with chronic renal failure? Sleep disorders are common in adults with chronic kidney disease and are often present even at the early stage of chronic kidney disease. The prevalence, as I mentioned before, from 50 to 18 adults before or after dialysis initiation and 30 to 50 after successfully kidney transplantation. In contrast to adults, children and adolescents have been associated only a limited number of study. <clears throat> In 2019, Dr. Stabile re, uh, reported a study to assess sleep disturbance in children with chronic kidney disease. 51 child with chronic kidney disease, stage two to five compared to health, healthy child. Based this study on questionnaire method only, as we see here, arousal, daytime sleep, and insomnia is significant higher than the control group. And also we noticed that sleep disorder breathing around 10%, not that significant uh, result. The, this study was confirmed the previous report of high prevalence of sleep disturb in the chronic kidney disease patients Uremia, uremia, edema, and acidosis, altered sleep-awake rhythm, anemia, and inadequate iron store, malnutrition and obesity have been implicated in the pathogenesis of a sleep disorder. Unfortunately, this study not showing the difference between the chronic renal failure stage in sleep disturbance. What about children on peritoneal dialysis? <clears throat> So this study was presented by Dr. Claudi. It is a small cohort study, around eight patients. It was evaluated by both pulsomonography and validated questionnaire. Here, as we see here, there is 62% having the sleep disturbance, and that is high uh, prevalence rate of sleep disturbance. And there is also 50% with obstructive sleep apnea and daytime sleepless. In this study, they believe that this high prevalence of sleep disturbance, it might relate it because it is the dialysis per se, mainly in the night, and because alarming of the, of the machine, it might disturbing their sleep. <clears throat> what about children on hemodialysis? So uh, this is what the first pediatric report uh, by Dr. Davis fr from uh, Ohio in 2004. 21 children on hemodialysis based on the questionnaire method. Uh, he put the four symptom domain of a sleep disorder, sleep disorder breathing, restless leg syndrome, excessive daytime sleepness, and inadequate sleep time. So the result came that 86 Person with the patient endorsed sleep disturbance symptom in children undergoing hemodialysis. And that is similar prevalence of patients having uh, chronic illness such as bronchial asthma and juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and some of the neuromuscular disease. 
Also, the result here is similar to the adult result. Sleep disorder breathing, like snoring, is high here, is around 46% comparing to the general population. Restless syndrome is around 29%. Excessive daytime sleepness, 60%, and inadequate sleep time is up to 48%. This is the recent study in this year, 2020, by Dr. Naveen. He reported a cross-sectional study, sleep disturbance in children and adolescents undergoing dialysis. They're using both modified airport scale and pulse somnography. Around 40 patients with endothelial disease, different uh, primary cause uh, versus uh, 40 healthy child. Again here, it was significant sleep disorder breathing around 40% comparing to 5% only in the general population. This significant increase of sleep, of sleep disorder breathing. Excessive day sleepness here was showing lower result comparing to the previous study and that was not explained in, in this study. <clears throat> Several factors may explain the relatively high frequency of a sleep problem. Iron deficiency has been implicated in the etiology of secondary rest leg syndrome, susceptibility of children to obstructive sleep apnea, especially during the peak age of two to six years, when the tonsil and adenoid are larger in relationship to upper airway size. Dialysis procedure itself might be expected to disturb sleep and possibility contribute to either insufficient or poor quality sleep. Now I will talk about the children post kidney transplantation. The role of kidney transplantation remain unclear with some studies showing marginal or no improvement in sleep quality and frequency of disturbance after successfully kidney transplantation. Alternatively, kidney transplantation has been associated with improvement of sleep disturbance in pulsomnography adult study. Transplantation may offer a potential cure for severe sleep disturbance in intestinal disease, and that was published in some case report in adult study. I found this uh, case report, which was interested, uh, published by Dr. Ima in Pediatric Nephrology 2010. Uh, it is a two years old gear with intestinal disease, which secondary to Danish trans syndrome found to have multiple DSAT in her in the night. Sleep study predominantly showed that she has central apnea and hypoapnea with the DSAT reach up to 80%. So she has commenced on 0.5 nasal cannula oxygen with unclear reason for her central apnea. After transplant, exactly in day four, post kidney transplant, it was noted that her oxygen could be weaned without an episode of desatting or bradycardia occurring. Uh, even in this study, they think that the patient improved may relate related to correction of the acid base balance, uh, hemoglobin level, and reduction of urea. This is another study by Dr. Davis, was published in 2011. And it is unique study because it comparing the patient on chronic renal failure versus dialysis and post kidney transplantation. It is the largest study. He used here three questionnaire method. Uh, first is a board sleepness scale. Then he used also the pediatric sleep questionnaire. And this was designed to assist sleep disorder breathing and obstructive sleep apnea. And the third questionnaire he used, the wrist leg syndrome questionnaire was modified from adult questionnaire. Around 159 child, four symptom domain for sleep disorder, sleep disorder breathing, restless leg syndrome, and excessive daytime sleepness with inadequate sleep time. Again, the study was showing significant percent of sleep disturbance breathing among the chronic renal failure uh, and dialysis. And even the transplant, the interesting, they found also the transplant patient, they're having high percent of sleep disturbance. And it was not explained in this study, the reason behind that. 
Inadequate sleep was in the lower percent. And if you see the, all the four symptom domain, the main issue mainly in the dialysis patients, like for here in sleep disturbance, it's around 67%, in rest leg syndrome, around 16%, excessive sleeping is around 60%. But the high prevalence in kidney transplant was not understood in, in, in this uh, result. Dr. Brajulu, he, he mentioned some of the factor mainly, may, mainly to the persistence of the sleep disturbance in kidney transplant patient that they have unique because they, they are having only one kidney. They use of immunosuppressive medication. The other comorbidity, including obesity, high risk of cardiovascular diseases, the, their risk of malignancy, and anxiety of losing their uh, allograft. So it's still the, the, the idea of why not improved after the transplant was not clearly yet. So this is my last slide. I will summarize my presentation. Sleep disturbance in children with chronic kidney disease and hemodialysis is significantly higher compared to the healthy children. The pathogenesis not determined yet, but factor as serum creatinine, potassium, iron, hemoglobin, and urea might be related to the sleep disturbance. Melatonin supplement and nectarial dialysis was not sufficiently studied in pediatric. I believe further study are required to understand the pathogenesis of sleep disturbance. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nye, for this uh, excellent uh, comprehensive review for the sleep disorder uh, in uh, uh, children with in hemodialysis or bretonic dialysis. Uh, maybe I will start uh, the question by myself, then after that we'll open the question for others. Uh, do you think, Dr. Nye, if those with the vascular access stenosis are liable to have more sleep disorder uh, compared to others? Exactly. In some study, they mentioned the clear thing that the patient who has not suitable or not uh, uh, fine access of hemodialysis, they are prone to have more sleep disturbance. But most of the results, what they have it, uh, published in pediatric, they are showing that all the patient was involved, they don't have any access issue. And of course, another yeah. issue is the dialysis time or dialysis shift time. If it is in the, in the day or in the night, also it might behind one of the factors that might uh, affecting the sleep disturbance. Uh, the next question, does uh, uh, continuous flu uh, bretonal dialysis provide acceptable uh, clearance of ammonia and water uh, in a, a way better than regular BD? Oh, sorry. I, I is, think uh, Dr. Khaled, this is the- Yeah, this the is, yeah, the, this is, yeah, yeah. for different. Uh, next question, uh, for, uh, is there any uh, difference between uh, type of fluid using in peritoneal dialysis? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, pineal or physioneal, uh, is there any correlation between the sleep disorder with the type of fluid using in peritoneal dialysis? This is a good question, Dr. Hart, but actually I didn't cross such uh, information about the different peritoneal fluid having any rule to differentiate between or affecting the sleep disturbance. Because some uh, people, they claim that uh, uh, those with uh, using physionil, this is in a small study, they ended by metabolic alkalosis and hypercapnia, and this will end by sleep apnea. Exactly, metabolic alkalosis, metabolic acidosis, they might having the role of a sleep disturbance, but there is no clear study that showing that it might affect uh, based on the metabolic alkalosis. It is just a factor. It might causing the sleep disturbance. Uh, I think at the end, I would like to thank you, Dr. Nye, for this uh, comprehensive review. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Khaled. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Khaled. Uh, uh, Dr. Nai for uh, this uh, nice uh, presentation. Uh, I think uh, now we uh, come to the uh, Industrial Symposium, um, which is sponsored uh, by Fresenius Company. Um, and uh, with us, uh, Ms. Maha Al-Wahsh uh, and uh, Mr. Matthias. So, uh, Mike, with you, please introduce yourself and uh, please start. 
Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthias Keil. I'm working for Fresenius Medical Care in Germany in the headquarters. And I'm here today uh, with Mrs. Maha Awash, uh, presenting a, a short symposium on our therapy data management systems uh, and the potential efficiency gains that you can have. Um, I'm going to share my slides with you. Um, and before I hand over to uh, Ms. Uh, Awash, um, she's a hemodialysis assistant head nurse at the King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center. And um, we are here uh, today welcoming you uh, on behalf of uh, Dr. Ahmed El Aziz, uh, who's working for our sales and marketing department uh, for Fresenius Medical Care in Saudi Arabia. Um, as I said, uh, today we're going to talk about the therapy data management system, um, or short TDMS. Um, for which I will give a short a general overview um, before uh, Ms. Alwash will go into her presentation on the potential efficiency gains by integrating our TDMS system to a hospital information system like Cerner, which they are using at the King Faisal Specialist Hospital. Um, my presentation today will bring you basically for all um, areas of a hospital or of a dialysis center in a hospital. So we are going to talk about um, several applications which uh, we cluster into therapy management, mainly done by the physicians, treatment management, usually uh, performed by the nurses, but also we're going to cover topics like data analysis and the integration as I mentioned. Um, the TDMS or therapy data management system is set up uh, of several specialized um, software solutions, which shape one dialysis software suite. So um, at the heart of uh, dialysis treatment, of course, um, there is the dialysis device, which creates a lot of information while treating the patient. And this information is uh, usually needed for various purposes, one being driving the treatment and the therapy of the patient to improve the outcomes. But another one um, not to be forgotten is uh, the uh, sharing data with other specialties in the hospital. And for example, um, collecting data that is needed for reimbursement or billing. Um, one, component of the TDMS is the so-called therapy monitor, which is very close to the dialysis device. And the typical question here during uh, the treatment of a patient is, how can I keep an overview as a nurse, as a head nurse, um, over all the treatments that are currently going on in the clinic? So um, our proposal is to use therapy monitor um, for a potentially complete automatic documentation. So all the data that is uh, coming from the dialysis device can be recorded automatically. But this is not it um, because we also um, have the potential um, to document additional uh, things like the medication applied, um, like unforeseen events or simple things as checklists in the system. And um, this, leads to um, a lot of information. So uh, there we prevent loss of information and um, we also lead to potential time savings, which you can see on the next slide. We did a study with our therapy monitor and found out that there are eight workflow steps during each dialysis treatment that are immediately affected by applying therapy monitor. And this leads to a potential time savings of 25 minutes per treatment um, for the nursing staff. And I think this is this time saved, usually spent for things like documentation or handling the dialysis device is well spent by taking better care of the patients. Another integral part of our TDMS system is the therapy support suite, which is the so-called um, health record of the patient. So in the therapy support suite, the physician defines the therapy but that's not it. It's actually a, a small clinic management system when it comes to the field of specialized dialysis care. So we, uh, we provide means to follow the complete patient pathway here across different uh, uh, therapies like hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. 
And we have a very modular system which you can customize to fit your needs um, so that we support you in your daily tasks as a specialized um, nephrologist. Therapy Support Suite and Therapy Monitor form the center of our system. And I would like to give you a short uh, view on how this process um, in a daily practice works. So a patient will get a patient card when he's enrolled into the system. And this patient card is used to identify the patient, for example, at the scale when he starts his dialysis treatment. So the patient will put the card into a small card reader next to the scale. And this causes the system to automatically recognize the patient, start a treatment in the therapy monitor application and retrieving the prescription for today's treatment into therapy monitor. This prescription is then automatically transferred through the network to the dialysis device once the patient arrives at the device and the nurse or the patient put the patient card into the device. With a single click and uh, on the screen of the device and a review of the prescription, the nurse can actually transfer all the treatment information to the dialysis device in a couple of seconds. While treating the patient, we are recording minutely data packages. And as I said, the nurse also has the possibility to do documentation in therapy monitor. At the end of the treatment, the patient goes to the scale again to capture his post dialysis weight and using the card again to identify himself. And then once the treatment is done and everything is, uh, is saved and uh, stored, we transfer the data into therapy support suite where it can then be used uh, to reassess the treatments, to compare it to laboratory outcomes and other things. Of course, such a system is, uh, is only as good uh, if it supports the nurses and the physicians in their daily practice. This is why we also extend the system to the dialysis device by using the so-called data exchange panel. These are displays that we can show on the screen of the device, which is a surface that the nurse usually already interacts with in her daily routine, and she's very used to. So they can click and confirm certain tasks and to-dos, or as I said, they can, also, uh, review, uh, they can also review laboratory results here. So we try to bring the whole documentation bedside instead of having a nurse uh, or a physician sitting in front of a PC screen like we do right now. Um, as I said, the whole system is also covering various therapies, which is why we have another software solution specialized for peritoneal dialysis, which we can connect to therapy support suite. So here in this system, you can drive the peritoneal dialysis therapy, um, and you can actually customize it to your patient's needs by doing quality assurance tests of the peritoneum of the patient, and then using an integrated modeling and analysis function, which creates a customized treatment for the patient, which can then be transferred to the uh, cycler of the patient or can be run as a CAPD scheme um, with a printout, for example. That being said, we have collected a lot of data in therapy support suite from different therapies and also from different data sources. But we also integrate our system into a hospital or laboratory system by using a communication engine. This communication engine allows us to have a standardized data exchange between our TDMS and the hospital information system, which leads to a lot of efficiency gains because it eliminates manual documentation of data into systems and therefore also reduces time needed by the nursing staff for data entry. But that's not it. It also reduces risk of typing errors or other um, potential errors in the transfer of information, which can be, uh, which can improve the safety in your dialysis clinic. And just to give you a short overview, there's a lot of information that we can actually exchange. It all starts with the administrative data, of course, because we need to know which patient we are treating in our dialysis unit. But then the second uh, option is laboratory data input. 
that is very, very valuable because the laboratory data gives you all the necessary insights of the, of the blood status of the patient. And together with the treatment outcomes from the dialysis device is the best insight into the patient's well-being. Um, when it comes to reporting our outcomes, we can report treatment results. We can also inform others about the scheduling information, for example, which can be handy if you want to have the patient visiting another specialist uh, on a day where he is already coming for dialysis treatments. We can also exchange financial information or all kinds of reports with the hospital system in a PDF or data format. And last but not least, we can also get tasks from the hospital system into our TSFs, which are then to be performed either by the nursing staff or by the physicians. With so much data in TSS, we also provide means for analysis by a product called Nephrological Cockpit. The idea here is to provide you with some easy to use workflows with some easy to understand data analysis um, so that you can find out patients in need. You can define the key performance indicators, like for example, laboratory parameters, here hemoglobin is shown as an example, and you can define the range where you would like your patients to be. And then you will see patients which are above targets or in the target range, and you can analyze and drill down to the individual comparing all of his outcomes um, side by side, and then you can take decisions, for example, by checking the medication in parallel um, or seeing the currently used dialysis filter, for example. We think that this uh, TDMS offers you a lot of possibilities for your specialized care that you as a nephrologist uh, need to provide in a dialysis unit. And as I said, Mrs. Avash will go now into details and her lessons learned uh, from uh, applying TDMS uh, in her dialysis unit and also the integration to the hospital information system. So I'm going to stop sharing now and I will hand over. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, my dear. Uh, now I'm sharing my screen. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I just would like to share our experience as King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center on the uh, in the project of integral hemodialysis automation for increased efficiency. For uh, the introduction that it, uh, it was the hemodialysis unit was planning to renew hemodialysis machines with the latest technologies. This is aligned with the King Faisal Specialist Hospital vision and mission by being world leading in the care, uh, in the patient care with the, uh, uh, excellence and innovation. The proposal was new machines are complemented with a specialized software for our dialysis center that will provide safer treatment. Efficient workflow supported by integrating those machines through specialized software for dialysis centers into the hospital information system to save time, effort, and to ensure accuracy. Supplementing the hospital integrated system, the aggreg aggregated data is available in specialized software for dialysis center and is used for patient future treatment plans and also as a history to help the guide a clinical judgment. why there was a need for this integration, why I was needing that a project. Let's go for our background before this project, what it was our history or what it was the situation. Each nurse is assigned to five to six patients per day. This is, you know, it is international for the chronic hemodialysis for the ratio. Per day, that's me, we are talking about 12 hours working. It is required on average 25 parameters to be documented in our basis according to the standard of care that we are following and patient safety goals. 
Each nurse spent for documentation. We found through time and motion study that around 10 minutes was being spent for each patient hourly to document these parameters. Only 50% of hemodialysis nurses' clinical time can be utilized on the direct patient care, as the other 50% is spent on documentation. This is as our internal audit result. Patient and staff satisfaction rate were acceptable, but on the lower side of the recommended scoring following the nursing data national quality indicators. So we were aiming by the end of this project that to have to meet the following objectives that the hemodialysis staff would save uh, an estimated 50% of their clinical time, which is consumed on manual documentation and even duplication. Hemodialysis nurses can spend more than 50% of their clinical time on direct patient care as a holistic approach to patient care increasing the patient and, of course, the staff satisfaction rate. Streamline documentation errors in relation real-time data capture. Enhancement on the workflow, which will impact on equality of patient care. Like we will have less room for documentation errors and meeting KPIs indicators safety standards. What is the phases that we experience in this project? and we go through it. First, it was about needs analysis. We are the, the beautiful about this product that it has rooms for selection. Uh, we are uh, uh, identify our preference as unit, like you know, what kind of information and data I want it to be integrated. There is areas that I might uh, exclude it or I need to add it, there is a room for that. So we uh, analyze the needs for the unit and we find what is the, uh, the needs that we needed. The second phase we go through the validation and testing process. This is for a test patient on test domain in the inside of the hospital. So we uh, did uh, we a sample hemodialysis treatment uh, with a, a, a test patient and we check it and testing that one uh, and we evaluate, re-evaluate if where we supposed to support before the second phase, which we went after that we be sure that everything was being okay on the testing more, uh, testing patient and testing more uh, domain. We moved again for selecting like, you know, a limited number of patients, live patients, real patients, and we start doing the same what we did in the test uh, phase. But, and then in the same time, we are evaluating and re-evaluating, validating this information, which was integrated from the machine uh, system or uh, TSS uh, part and how it is reflecting on our hospital uh, informative uh, system. In, in, this, in this time, now we are moving for the second phase, which is that to enter the uh, patient, the whole patient data. Part of it, it was uh, the prescription and the, uh, the bio data, it was uh, taken from our informative system, the hospital informative system, because it was for us, for the patient data, it was the truth resource for that one. There was a training for our staff. We choose the resource people. Like, you know, we train the trainers that who will train the later all the, the units. Uh, it was starting by uh, resource people. Like uh, we are identify between five to seven people that to be the resource and the support for the others. After the training was being completed and we are sure that for the uh, limited number of real patient, it was everything is okay, we go live. For that moment the, to go live from a zero time uh, to go live, uh, excluding all the waste time, it was exactly around five months to go live for that project. Uh, 
there is things that the COVID-19 came after that, and there is still there is a work that left to be done also, and it will be like another phase that we need to, to do it uh, with our partner in this project, which is integrating a big red, which is about the medication and the lab result, which is it's already available in that product. This is the second phase that we need to see it with our system that in two, on two direction. Then after that, of course, the, we will reach the project closure and following it with auditing and upgrading and maintaining the standards. As what I mentioned, the project time to go live, excluding all the way, like, you know, uh, the stopping time or leaves, it was five months with a great result. The conclusion was from this uh, project excellence, I, I eliminated uh, any documentation errors uh, related for uh, 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 human errors. Uh, excellence that I have uh, the same data and information that I get it from the machine. It is in a real time capture in our system. Uh, patient centric, I give more time, clinical time for our staff to deal with our patient holistic Instead, as what Matthew before saying, instead of sitting in front of a PC, now at that time I was spending 10 minutes for each patient every hour. Now that 10 minutes, every hour for each patient, it is around, around one hour or 40 minutes for each patient. This is increased in his direct patient care. A promoting patient experience, and in the same time, promoting our staff experience in that one. The customer satisfaction for the phase that we reached that we are already having all the parameters from vital signs. We are talking about arterial pressure, venous pressure, TMP. Uh, we are talking about um, uh, substitute volume, about blood flow rate, ultrafiltrations. Uh, we are talking about backup. All these parameters, they are there. It is just only one click at the end of the treatment. I'm completing my treatment. It will be uh, uh, shown in our informative system. So it was really reaching the nine out of 10. If you get tired, learn to rest, not to quit. This is uh, my end of a slide. Thank you. If there is any questions. Thank you very much, Maha. Um, so we are both here to answer your questions. If you have any, uh, please free to, feel free to write um, or yeah, ask us directly. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, both of you, for uh, this uh, interesting uh, project. Uh, I just have uh, a question now. Uh, the, uh, what's your experience in Germany uh, about using this uh, the system? Uh, can you just uh, give us a brief about uh, uh, your experience in Germany uh, about using this system in the analysis unit? Yes. Um, so uh, personally, I'm located in Germany. Um, the headquarters of Fresenius Medical Care is in Germany, um, but the system, the TDMS is used uh, all around the globe. Um, we actually have, for example, uh, more than 750 installations of uh, therapy support suite, the, the EHR component uh, of the system. We also use, for example, the therapy monitor software in our own dialysis clinics um, around the globe so that we have more than 1,500 uh, installations. And uh, overall, uh, the experience is, is very good and, and very similar to uh, what Maha uh, uh, told us, that it really helps um, the, the nursing staff in their daily routine and the handling of the patients and the overall workflow uh, from arrival uh, till uh, the patient leaves again. Um, but it also uh, provides the necessary insights um, to the specialist uh, who performs the dialysis care and who has to take treatment decisions. Um, and at the same time with the integration, we can share all the information back to the hospital information system 
um, so that uh, also the other specialties have information like the patient's weight um, or like the blood pressure measurements, which we regularly um, measure. Um, so uh, in, in general, the feedback is uh, always positive. Um, it's also very positive that uh, it is linked uh, to the dialysis uh, devices, but not only ours. Um, also uh, devices of other vendors uh, can be connected, but then uh, you do not have the benefit of bringing the prescription to the device. Um, this is then still uh, in the hand of the nurses to, uh, uh, to modify the device settings. Um, yeah, that being said, I think it's a, it's a, a long history for Fresenius. Um, the TDMS is available uh, since approximately uh, eight years now. Um, and we have seen uh, a good growth. Um, we are uh, we're quite happy about the results. And at the same time, it's uh, still a lot of work to continuously improve the system. Yeah. Okay, thank you. There are some questions uh, in the Q&A session. Uh, one is uh, if we have any experience of that system in other Middle East hospitals um, and uh, whether it can fit any other company devices. Um, okay, so yes, we do have uh, experience in other uh, Middle East clinics as well. Um, for example, uh, in uh, we have the system installed in Dubai. Um, we uh, also have um, other countries, but um, the, the Middle East is, uh, let's say we, we, are, we are in the King Faisal Hospital since quite a while. Um, it was only recently that this uh, extension was implemented. Um, our, our strongest markets right now, um, to be honest, are in uh, Central Europe and also in Asia Pacific. Um, but uh, yeah, that being said, I think a dialysis clinic is, uh, is, is usually working in, in very similar ways, uh, independent from where you go around the globe. Uh, and I think the system uh, fits uh, the, the needs of dialysis units quite nicely. Um, and the question to the other company machines, um, yes, we can, for example, uh, connect Baxter Artist Physio devices, um, also um, <clears throat> some other machines. Uh, we are working on connections to Nikizo DBBXA and also to the Brown Dialog IQ uh, as new devices to be connected. And here we have a close exchange with the other device manufacturers. The, the target is not to, to limit this uh, to Fresenius devices. Of course, there's benefits if you use a Fresenius device because we are limited in what we can do with third-party devices, but the target is really to provide a documentation system um, for dialysis specialists. And there's one question for you, Maha, in the Q&A. Uh, the question is, say, do you experience the delay in loading treatment parameters at the beginning of starting the treatment, especially when you have to start 20 to 40 patients at the same time? Actually, our experience or what is our current situation, we are dialyzing in the same moment between 50 to uh, 54 patients in the same time. We are talking uh, about more than this number and we don't have the delay. Uh, at the beginning, maybe on the testing phase, it was like, you know, few seconds. Then after that, it is immediately, it is there. We are, uh, the uh, information between the machine and TSS is there. Now to loading all that information in our system, it is a part, uh, it is the, the way how we are having all this information, it is after we finishing the treatment, we are closing the treatment immediately. After we are closing that treatment, it will be shown inside of our information system in the real time. So if it's taken at 10, it will be reflecting in our information system at 10 exactly. The thing is that it needs a, a staff compliance in the uh, uh, including the, the treatment. So you can see that uh, uh, reflection in, in your informative system. Thank you very much for the questions until now. Um, 
I think it's uh, it was a good question whether we see uh, delays because uh, especially such delays can hold up uh, the start of dialysis treatments, right? Um, it is it is important that the system works in the background and uh, at the moment when the patient arrives at the machine and the nurse puts the card into the device that the information is there uh, basically immediately because uh, otherwise all the benefits of, of entering data versus an automatic uh, prescription transfer uh, would be gone. Yeah. Um, oh, interesting question, um, because you're using this quite a while now, uh, Mahat. I, did you ever experience yes. any breakdowns of the system? And, and what are your okay. countermeasures? Maybe as a second uh, question as well. Okay, for the, uh, the question of if we are ever experienced any breakdown in the system, uh, with the TSS, no. The things it's my uh, uh, internet connections. Uh, like, you know, if we are uh, talking about the continuous maintenance, you need to check your uh, net ports that it is working or not. Uh, you need to uh, check always. Uh, we are talking about inside uh, a house, like, you know, in, inside of the hospital. If you are sure of your connections that they are working, the system, no, it is it is working. Like, you know, there is no breakdown in that one. Uh, even if there is, like, you know, in our system, in the hospital system, if there is downtime system, downtime, like, you know, for maintenance or this these things, every four hours there is uh, updating. So we are having uh, the, the card, the one that we are having, the beauty of the card that we are having in the TSS, it can kept that treatment. Uh, how many time, How many uh, treatments, Matthew, that it is? it can save on that card? It stores the last three treatment results. Yeah. Of three treatments. And that, that one you can, uh, even on the machine itself, it will save the last three treatments, not only on the card. The, uh, the things for breakdown, it is the same as in any uh, informative system that if there is a breakdown or you need to uh, prepare yourself for like, you know, what is in the downtime, what is the type of documentation that you have it. In the hemodiasis, the moment that the hemodiasis is working, there is no electricity fall down or turned off that machine, it is there. Very good, thank you. Yeah, and this uh, the the data stored on the patient card can then be imported into the system, um, so it's not only that you can review it on the machine, uh, you can actually import it, and then you have a uh, still a little bit limited documentation. Um, and of course, all the additional nursing activities need to be documented then afterwards, um, but at least the full machine side is documented. Um, uh, the last question um, I read right now is if the prescription is changed today. When will it be applicable for the system? That's a that's a good question. So uh, basically, it depends on, uh, on on the next treatment of the patient. So usually, when the physician uh, saves uh, the prescription, this prescription, and if this is the, the let's say leading prescriptions, because a patient can have multiple ones. Um, but if it's uh, scheduled for the next treatment or for all the treatments, then the next time you start a dialysis treatment uh, on the dialysis device, this prescription will be used. So um, you basically have it for the next treatment or the next treatment it was scheduled for. That's the most important information because um, a doctor might make a change to a prescription. But if this is the, the prescription that is to be used, let's say after the long uh, intradialytic uh, uh, period, right? Um, then potentially it should not be used on the next session, but let's say on the next Monday after the two days uh, weekend. Okay. There's one more question in the question and answer. Yeah, uh, are you suggesting that it is the network connection that causes delay in the loading? We start about 60 to 7 patients in the same time and experience almost all the time. Um, I would say yes. Um, this, is, this is not a limitation to, to the system itself. Um, it is a, a limitation, I would say, to the network. And uh, let's say with our specialists and with the help of the IT of the hospital, we should start an investigation 
um, if we have uh, problems there, if we have uh, limitations, because um, we, are, we are also using the system in, in much bigger clinics, for example, in Asia Pacific, where we start 100, 150 treatments for each uh, dialysis session. Um, and the people are just rushing in more or less uncoordinated and, and we still should not have a system breakdown here. Um, so I would recommend an analysis. There's no more question. Uh, I think uh, come to the conclusion of this uh, industrial symposium. And uh, thank you, Maha. Thank you, Matthews, for your presentation and answering the question. Uh, and uh, on behalf of the Committee of Nephrology and Transplantation, I would like to thank uh, uh, our uh, uh, Fresenius Company for sponsoring this uh, session. And uh, by this, we'll come to the end of the first day of the conference. And um, I hope everybody enjoyed this day. Uh, it was, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the speaker and moderator for the excellent presentation and moderation. So I hope see you all uh, tomorrow, uh, second day of uh, this conference uh, at 4.30 p.m. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.